Today, playing with Banking Fire or Bye Bye Volker. The DFA Daily to the 26th of June 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest posts covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour and with a touch of philosophy on the side. The big news in finance comes from offshore today, with the US banking regulators revealing the results of their latest stress tests on the same day that regulations are further eased to allow banks to speculate more. This is as anti-Glass-Steagall as it gets. After the 2009 global financial crisis, when we got a glimpse of the risks within the financial system, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act tried to bring the banks to heel. It forced the big US banks, which of course cast a shadow across the banking system globally, to rein in some of their speculative activities. Within this, one aspect was the so-called Volcker Rule, which is actually Section 619 of the Dodd-Frank Act and guides the implementation of Section 13 of the Bank Holding Company Act of 1956. It's named after former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker. As recently defined, the Volcker Rule prohibited banks from using their own accounts for short-term proprietary trading of securities, derivatives and commodity futures, as well as options on any of these instruments. The rule also barred banks or insured depository institutions from acquiring or retaining ownership interests in hedge funds or private equity funds subject to certain exemptions. In other words, the rule aimed to discourage banks from taking too much risk by barring them from using their own funds to make these types of investments to increase profits. The Volcker rule relied on the premise that these speculative trading activities do not benefit banks' customers. The original rule went into effect on April the 1st, 2014, with banks' full compliance required by July the 21st, 2015, although the Federal Reserve subsequently set procedures for banks to request extended time for transition into full compliance for certain activities and investments. And then on May the 30th, 2018, members of the Federal Reserve Board, led by its chairman, Jerome Powell, voted unanimously to push forward a proposal to loosen the restrictions around the Volcker Rule and reduce the costs for banks that need to comply with it. The goal, they said, is to replace overly complex and inefficient requirements with a more streamlined set of requirements. Just remember, the Fed is owned by the big banks that's all you need to know. In effect, this softened the aspect of Volcker that restricted lenders from engaging in proprietary trading, the practice of making market bets for themselves instead of on behalf of clients. But now the Federal Reserve, the Office of Control of the Currency and the FIDC approved changes to the Volcker rule yesterday that will let banks increase their dealings with certain funds. The regulators also scrapped a requirement that lenders hold margin when trading derivatives with their affiliates. The revisions will complete what what dogs appointed by President Donald Trump have referred to as Volcker II. Volcker II allows banks to take stakes in venture capital funds that were previously banned in an effort to provide greater flexibility in sponsoring funds that provide loans to companies. The change is mostly similar to what regulators proposed last year. These changes were also approved by the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and the FDIC board passed the new rule in a three-to-one vote, with Chairman Janela McWilliams saying the changes should improve both compliance and supervision. Democratic board member Martin Gruber, however, opposed the move, saying it leaves Volcker severely weakened and risks repeating the mistakes of the 2008 financial crisis. Volcker, too, didn't include all of the industry's demands for relief. In a March comment letter, Goldman Sachs had urged regulators to eliminate certain Volcker interpretations that have, quote, restricted our ability to invest in certain incubator companies that provide capital and know-how to start-up companies and entrepreneurs. The agencies didn't act on that request. <laughs> 
In scrapping the requirement that banks post margin for trains between affiliates, regulators did add a new threshold to prevent banks from abusing the relief. If a firm operating under the old room would have had to set aside initial margin exceeding more than 15% of its so-called Tier 1 capital, then it still has to set aside margin that surpasses that amount. The demand, which is meant to boost the safety and soundness of the new approach, will force banks to continue calculating on a daily basis what their margin requirements would have been under the rule that's been eliminated. The industry and regulators argue that requiring margin for inter-affiliate transactions made it difficult for banks to manage their risks. But critics say forcing banks to maintain an extra cushion against losses helped protect subsidiaries that are backed by the federal government, including through deposit insurance. And on the same day, banking agencies removed a separate requirement that banks hold margin when engaging in derivatives transactions with their own affiliates. Getting rid of the demand could free up an estimated $40 billion across the industry. But, again, critics argue it could mean taxpayer-backed banks will amplify their risks to more dangerous levels. The FDIC's Grunberg opposed the change to swap rules, arguing that it removes a critical protection for banks. And the Fed Governor, Lael Brennard, iterated that concern, saying in a statement that she dissented from the Fed's approval because she fears the deregulatory move could again leave banks exposed to the build-up of risky derivatives. Now, this may be the last reforms before the next US election, but the rollbacks are pretty astonishing given the helicopter money the Fed has been splashing about to support Wall Street. The bottom line is that Wall Street banks will soon be able to boost investments in venture capital funds and pocket billions of dollars they've had to set aside to backstop derivative trades as US regulators continue their push to roll back post-crisis constraints. And on the very same day, the regulators also released their latest bank stress tests, plus additional sensitive analysis that the board conducted in light of the coronavirus event. The banking system has been a source of strength during this crisis, Vice Chair Randall K. Quarles said, and the result of our sensitive analysis shows that our banks can remain strong in the face of even the harshest shocks. In addition, to its normal stress tests, the board conducted a sensitive analysis to assess the resiliency of large banks under three hypothetical recessions or downside scenarios, which could result from the virus event. The scenarios include a V-shaped recession and recovery, a slower U-shaped recession and recovery, and a W-shaped double-dip recession. In all three downside scenarios, the unemployment rate peaked at between 15.6% and 19.5%, which is significantly more stringent than any of the board's pre-coronavirus stress test scenarios. They underscored, of course, that these scenarios are not predictions or forecasts of the likely path of the economy or financial markets. In aggregate, loan losses for the 34 banks ranged from $560 billion to $700 billion in the sensitive analysis and aggregate capital ratios declined from 12% in the fourth quarter of 2019 to between 9.5% and 7.7% under the hypothetical downside scenarios. Under the U and W shaped scenarios, most firms remain well capitalized, but several would approach minimum capital levels. The sensitive analysis does not incorporate the potential effects of government stimulus payments and expanded unemployment insurance, by the way. In the light of these results, the board took several actions following its stress tests to ensure large banks remain resilient despite the economic uncertainty from the virus. For the third quarter of this year, the bank is requiring large banks to preserve capital by suspending share repurchases, capping dividend payments, and allowing dividends according to a formula based on recent income. The board is also requiring banks to reevaluate their longer term capital plans. All large banks will be required to resubmit and update their capital plans later this year to reflect current stresses, which will help firms reassess their capital needs and maintain strong capital planning practices during this period of uncertainty. And the board will conduct additional analysis each quarter to determine if adjustments to this response are appropriate.
During the third quarter, no share repurchases will be permitted. In recent years, share repurchases have represented approximately 70% of shareholder payouts from large banks. The board is also capping dividend payments to the amount paid in the second quarter and is further limiting them to an amount based on recent earnings. As a result, a bank cannot increase its dividend and can pay dividends if it has sufficient income earned. The board also released the results of its full stress tests designed before the virus. The results from that test are comparable to a V-shaped downside scenario in the sensitive analysis in aggregate and shows that all large banks remain strongly capitalised. The board will use the results of this test to set the new stress capital buffer requirement for these firms, which will take effect as planned in the fourth quarter. Additionally, the board will not be objecting to five foreign banks whose capital planning practices were evaluated as part of the stress tests. And the latest stats from the US Labor Department shows that the total number of people to receive unemployment compensation in the week ended June the 20th under all the federal and state programs together are 30.55 million people. And that's up 1.3 million from last week. This is just below the peak that was hit back in May the 23rd. But the unemployment sands are shifting, with workers in places like hotels and bars, retail and restaurants returning to work just as corporate jobs are being cut. Many small companies can lay staff off without hitting the headlines, whereas larger companies like Macy's, 3,900 cut, do. These are in management and corporate areas. And this trend will likely continue as airlines and other large companies follow suit. We should also watch out for financial pressures on the various states, translating into public sector job cuts too. Slower, but likely. We also know that four states have yet to process thousands of claims so that gross totals of 30.55 million may be understated. If so we could be knocking on 20% unemployed, especially if you add in those not eligible for unemployment benefit. This is much higher than the official figure of 13.3% and is above the parameters of the recent stress tests. One reason why there is no V-shaped recovery in sight, despite what the markets are saying. Meanwhile here, the banks will be sighing with relief as the results of the appeal in the case between ASIC and Westpac were handed down. Back in September 2018, Westpac admitted to breaches of responsible lending obligations under the National Credit Act, agreeing to pay a $35 million civil penalty. ASIC and Westpac jointly approached the federal court, seeking orders that the bank contravene the responsible lending provisions due to failures in its automated systems. The breaches related to Westpac's home loan assessment processes during the period December 2011 and March 2015, during which approximately 250,000 home loans were approved by Westpac's automated decisioning system. ASIC had alleged that for approximately 50,000 home loans, Westpac received but did not use consumers' actual expense information, which exceeded the household expenditure measure, the HEM benchmark used by the bank. And it was also alleged that for a further 50,000 home loans, Westpac used the incorrect serviceability processes when assessing a consumer's capacity to repay a home loan upon the expiry of interest-only periods. The regulator contended that of the 100,000 loans, Westpac should not have automatically approved approximately 10,500 loans. However, the federal court was not convinced that Westpac breached its obligations, with Justice Perham seeking a friend of the court to review the case, reportedly saying that there is no fact before him that any unsuitable loans were made. Following his review of the case, Justice Perham judged that in complying with its NCCP obligations, a lender may do what it wants in the assessment process. Justice Perham took the view that a borrower's living expenses were not necessarily indicative of their future spending behaviour, acknowledging that borrowers would tighten their belts after taking out a home loan. I may eat Wagyu beef every day, washed down with the finest Shiraz, but if I really want my new home, I can make do with so much more modest fare. Knowing the amount I actually expend on food tells one nothing about 
about what the conceptual minimum is, but it is this conceptual minimum which drives the question of whether I can afford to make the payments on the loan. Without additional information, I do not consider that it is possible to accept that the consumer's declared living expenses tells one anything about their capacity to meet the repayments under the loan. However, ASIC decided to appeal Justice Perham's decision to address uncertainty caused by the verdict. And now, as the AFR says, Westpac Banking Corp has won a significant victory in the federal court, where two judges to one have found in favour of the bank on its interpretation of responsible lending duties, dealing another blow to the corporate regulator in the prolonged dispute. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission had appealed the original Shiraz and Wagyu decision, which found the regulator did not properly understand how the credit laws operate. While one of the appeal court judges sided with ASIC, the other two on Friday ordered its appeal to be dismissed and called on the regulator to pay the bank's legal costs. Given the split decision, ASIC may decide to seek leave to appeal the case to the High Court. The case is being watched by all banks because it is examining Westpac's automated loan assessment system. Big lenders all use computer algorithms to assess suitability for loans so they can create scaled processes to serve millions of customers. ASIC argued Westpac's system was based on improper inputs, including an index of household spending. It alleged the bank broke responsible lending laws 261,987 times between 2011 and 2015. This triggered a prolonged battle in the court on the proper interpretation of the central element of the national credit laws that was also in focus at the Hain Royal Commission. ASIC described the household expenditure measure, the HEM benchmark, as frugal, arguing it underestimated the true level of borrowers' expenses and hence allowed the bank to lend more than was appropriate. By relying on the benchmarks, it said Westpac could not reliably assess whether its customers could service their loans and so it was basing approvals on an imaginary capacity to repay them. But Westpac argued it was entitled to use the HEM as part of a formula that created a serviceability rule for the automated system. It said the law did not prescribe that banks use a simplistic formula of income minus expenses to determine eligibility and argue it was applying a 21st century system and was complex, multifactorial and sophisticated. ASIC appealed the case to the full federal court, arguing the original judge, Justice Nye Perham, failed to understand key parts of the responsible lending laws. Justice Perham had said parts of ASIC's case against Westpac were irrelevant, easily dispatched and incoherent. ASIC appealed not only to the use of a HEM, but the way in which Westpac calculated repayments amounts on interest only loans under its suitability assessment. If it continues up to the High Court, it will be the culmination of a fascinating case history given Westpac and ASIC originally agreed to settle it for $35 million, but Justice Perham declined to approve the settlement in November 2018, saying it was not based on the law and the court will not act as a mere rubber stamp. ASIC, by the way, yesterday also reminded brokers that their best interest duties will commence from 1 July 2020. Now, back in September 2019, ASIC reported that one in 10 consumers who took out a home loan via a mortgage broker were finding it hard to meet their repayments within 12 months. ASIC's research also found that although consumers generally expect a mortgage broker to secure the most suitable home loan for them, 58% were offered just one or two loan options by their broker, while many brokers recommended just one loan. In February 2020, ASIC acted on recommendations from the Hain Royal Commission and issued guidance on the new best interest duty obligations in a bid to ensure that brokers do the right thing by customers. Now, ASIC has advised mortgage brokers that it will strictly enforce the requirements that they act in customers' best interests. Legislation to impose the best interest duty takes effect on 1 July, although ASIC will delay enforcement of the new rules until the start of 2021, so brokers can carry on at the moment, still not necessarily acting in the best interests of their customers. Among other things, mortgage brokers will be required to take account the financial circumstances of each customer and closely scrutinise so-called cashback offers from lenders 
Under the new laws, mortgage brokers will be required to keep detailed records for each client, including a copy of the responsible lending assessment, a copy of the credit guide given to the client, information about the customer collected as part of the application and outcomes of the applications. Brokers will also need to record details of each conversation had with the customer, information showing how the broker acted in the best interest of the customer, the options and ultimate recommendation provided, as well as any conflicts that arose and how they were mitigated. ASIC Commissioner Sean Hughes said the guidance was even more important in the present environment where banks and other lenders were competing aggressively on price. In the low-cost borrowing environment, this guidance says you need to present a range of options to the customer and you need to make sure your advice is in the best interests of the customer and there are no other factors influencing your recommendation. The mortgage broker industry tried to fight off these best interest rules, which currently apply to financial planners, but were unsuccessful. Now they have six months to adapt to the new regulatory regime. Finally, the Reserve Bank warns of a 25% GDP loss by 2100 unless action is taken on climate change. More than 60 central banks, including the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Bank of England, have warned that global GDP could fall by 25% by 2100 if the world does not act to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. They suggested if the world acted to limit emissions to net zero by around 2070, giving a 67% chance of limiting global heating to 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels, the impact of the climate crisis on global GDP could be about 4%. The estimates are included in scenarios published by the Network for Greening the Financial System, a collection of 66 central banks and supervisors and 13 observer institutions described as the first of their kind. The scenarios are designed to guide bankers and financial regulators, including Australia's Prudential Regulatory Authority, in assessing the climate risks to the economy and financial sector. Their launch follows warnings from financial regulators of the economic threat posed by the climate crisis. Former Bank of England Governor Mark Carney last year warned it was possible the transition needed to tackle the climate crisis would result in an abrupt financial collapse and the risk of collapse would grow the longer action was delayed. In Australia, APRA board member Jeff Sahays warned climate change posed a material risk to the entire financial system and urge companies to start adapting. In a statement, the Network for Greening the Financial System said the changes to the climate were unprecedented. Frank Elderson, the chair of the network, said climate change leads to financial risks and therefore remains a vital issue for central banks and supervisors to address. The network said understanding the financial risks and economic costs required it to examine scenarios stretching decades ahead. It considered three possibilities. Under its orderly scenario, climate policies will be introduced soon and gradually tightened, limiting the risk of physical damage, including extreme weather events and the impact of the transition to low emissions. It would be expected to lead to a relatively small impact of about 4% of global GDP by 2100. Under the disorderly scenario, climate policies would not be introduced until 2030 and the emission reductions needed would be more abrupt than in an orderly world. It was estimated to have a significantly larger economic impact with nearly a 10% reduction in global GDP. In the third scenario, described as a hothouse world, action to deal with the climate crisis will be limited to current policies only countries international commitments would not be met and physical risks would be greatly increased as global emissions kept rising until 2080, leading to more than 3 degrees centigrade of warming. The network estimated the physical damage caused under this scenario would wipe out up to a quarter of annual global GDP by the end of the century, but it warned this could be an underestimate as it was not possible to adequately account for all risks, particularly from high impact events such as significant sea level rises, extreme weather and societal changes that could be triggered by climate-related migration and conflict. 
As a result, damages in the scenario will be larger than models suggest, particularly in regions with lower resilience and capacity for adaption, the network said. Emma Hurd, chief executive of the Investor Group on Climate Change, said the scenarios clearly demonstrated that climate change was a systemic economic threat that would undercut prosperity and job security. She said a low emissions transition was inevitable and would be cheaper and much less damaging if there was early action. In Australia, it would require a stable long-term policy framework and a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050. The alternative is sitting on our hands, which will continue to expose Australia to decarbonisation efforts across the world, whilst not gaining access to new opportunities that will stem from modernising the economy, she said. The scenarios will inform an APRA climate risk variability assessment that was expected to be finished by September before being delayed by the COVID-19 shutdown. Hurd said they should lead to companies consistently disclosing their exposure to climate risk rather than cherry-picking scenarios that suited their business strategy. Governments should also apply these climate scenarios to their own policy decisions, including COVID-19 economic recovery efforts, to ensure taxpayer expenditure is not put at risk by locking in support for carbon-intensive activities, she said. And on Thursday, the Australian Energy Council, representing all major electricity and gas companies, joined business groups, banks, major miners, the ACTU, institutional investors, all state governments and the federal opposition in calling for the government to adopt a target of net zero emissions by 2050 consistent with the Paris Agreement and for the introduction of stable national policies to set a path to the goal. It followed the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, setting out Labour's hopes for a bipartisan agreement to end more than a decade of political brawling over climate and energy policy. Of course, the government rejected both calls. Before I go, a quick reminder that on Tuesday the 30th of June at 8pm Sydney time, my guest on DFA Live will be Damien Klassen from Nucleus Wealth. He's an investment guru with a strong dose of reality and also looks at the property sector, so it will be an interesting session. And you can ask questions live or beforehand via the DFA blog. Links are below. Mark your diaries. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.